We'll go ahead and get started this morning. I was thinking about the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. You know, really, we cannot do anything without the presence of God. And that's exactly what we need this morning before anything else, before we do anything else. We need the Holy Ghost just to make himself welcome in our life. I was reading a quote by D.L. Moody that said that the reason that God can't fill us with the Holy Ghost, and I, he just meant within your everyday life to change us more to his image, and the, is the fact that we're so full of ourselves that there's no room for him. But what we need to do this morning is just make room for the Holy Ghost to come by and say, Lord, whatever you want to change in my life, change me. Whatever you want to do in my life, do it. Or may I be fully surrendered at your will that I may be transformed to the very image of Jesus Christ, that I may be more like you, and that I may know you in the power of your resurrection. Why don't we bow our heads and just prepare ourselves for our Sunday school? Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. We pray that the Holy Ghost would just make himself um, welcome here this morning, Lord, that we would make him welcome, Lord. That our hearts and our minds would be fully surrendered this morning in one mindset and one accord. That as we came with the same purpose for the same reason. That we may empty out ourselves. That we may get more of you than ever before, Lord. That we may know you like never before. This morning we rebuke any attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below. That no attack of the enemy may penetrate, Lord. I pray everything that is done here this morning throughout the entire service would be as the Father, that the Father would be pleased and magnified with what is said and done here, Lord. May we not hinder the Holy Ghost in any way from moving, Lord, but may he have full control of all the services, Lord, of every individual here, Lord. We ask all these, anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord, anoint the Sunday school teachers, Lord, that your message would come forth and that would be received with gladness, Lord. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Brother Eli, you want to collect the Sunday school offering? So we've been looking at the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is like no other book in the entire Bible. Whereas every other book in the Bible might have been written to record uh, uh, historical accounts, uh, prophecy, doctrine, the book of Psalms is always is different in the fact that all those books were written from God's perspective down to man. The book of Psalms is the inspired word of God. The Holy Ghost did inspire it. But when we're looking at it, it's the only book that records man's view up to God. God, I'm in, in distress. God, I've done this. God, I have sinned. Have mercy on me. And that's why we find so much comfort in it. And we, it's one of those books we go to because we can relate to the emotions and the feelings being portrayed because they're our feelings. There are our emotions. These are things that we go through. And therefore, we have that connection. And we can pray these psalms as well because of that connection, that it is from man to God and not the other way around. So it makes it a little bit easier. But the book of Psalms is a book composed of psalms. It is an inspired Jewish songbook that was compiled by three different editors, and there are five different books in the Book of Psalms. And the five different books lined up with what? The five books of Psalms, book one, book two, book three. From Genesis to Deuteronomy. Yep, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Each book, in order, corresponds with the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible. We've already discussed different as different psalms already, and different aspects of them. We looked through the big key words and what they meant. 
We looked at Psalm 119 and saw that it was an unusual poetic style, in fact, that in the sense that every eight lines corresponded with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The first being a left, which was that of an ox, represented by an ox, and finally down to top, which is represented by a cross. The, in the original crude Hebrew language, it looked like a cross. And when you look at that, it's all the way from a sacrifice to something that means the mark and signature. And when we look at our Christian lives, we know that the cross is the signature of Jesus Christ. It is his mark. He rose from the dead, but if he would have never rose from the dead, everything that was done on that cross would have been in vain. That cross is where our sins were forgiven, where the battle was won. We're starting to look at Psalm 120. Psalm 120, if you'd like to turn there. Psalm 120, and if you look right above Psalm 120, there should be, a, within your title there, it should say, a song of ascent, or songs of ascent, or a song of degrees, a, or songs of degrees. When we look at Psalm 120, it forms part of one of the major groups of psalms in the entire book. Not a part of book one, book two, book three, but rather as a collection, as a whole. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more when we get into the history of the Psalms. But we have Psalm 120 out, so we're going to go through our typical routine, like we're going to study a chapter. You're going to get all the details. So Psalm 120. A psalm of degree is what my says. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, and what shall be done unto thee? Thou false tongue, sharp arrows of the mighty with poles of juniper. Woe is me that I serve, sojourn in Meshach, and I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. So what are the what might be some key verses in Psalm 120? That verse that just sums up this whole chapter in a nutshell. sums up this thing in a nutshell for me. Does anybody have any else? Anybody else have any other verses that might describe this in a nutshell or is that about it? this that would summarize Psalm 120. I cried unto the Lord. I cried unto the Lord. Because really when we look at Psalm 120, uh, I'm assuming you saw that from the notes, from the look on your face. I only said one of them. Only one of them, I know. But when we look at this passage in a nutshell, it is the cry of an individual that is in distress. Does anybody else want to take, does, is there anything else that anybody else sees that might be a summary of this of Psalm 120 in a phrase or a word? They have 
is denoted I am for peace. I am for peace. We could also look at deliver my soul or woe is me because really in Psalm 120 the individual is in distress. People are coming against him. He's in distress. He's looking for the peace of God but he's saying, Lord, I am in distress and I cry unto you. Deliver me. What about some key words? Soul, maybe the obvious one, distress, or try lying, or lips, or war, or tongue. I mean, this man is in distress because people are going behind his back, they're lying to him, maybe they're calling him names to his face, they're lying about him to his face. He is in utmost turmoil because of what other people are doing. He wants to be a peacemaker. But everybody else is lying about him. They're speaking evil of him. Yeah. Now as we go down through, I cannot find anywhere where anything of Psalm 120 was quoted in the New Testament. When we're looking at the poetic style, verse 2 is synonymous parallelism. And what that is, is the same thing is repeated in different words. Deliver my soul, O oh, oh Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. And the second line clarifies the thought of the first line through either an example, explanation, or etc. Now here's where we're going to start talking about the Psalms of songs of ascent and the history behind them. People have different ideas on what the purpose of this collection was for. Because Psalm 20 is the first of a collection of 15 psalms. It runs from Psalm 120 through 134. And they are all known as Psalms of Degrees or Psalms of Ascent. But why are they called that? Most people will believe, will go with the theory, and they take it from the Jewish Mishnah, that these 15 psalms are associated with the 15 steps that led to the temple. When they would get to the first step, they would sing the first one, Psalm 120, second step, and so forth. These steps going into the temple are between the court of women and the court of men. There's also those that believe that these songs were also sung as they were making the pilgrimage to the temple. Because we know that on special holidays, all the Jews had to travel to Jerusalem to take their sin sacrifice and worship. We know that Paul went to um, Jerusalem. Jesus went to Jerusalem for Passover, the important Jewish holiday. They were to travel from wherever they lived all the way to Jerusalem. And as they took their journey, it's believed that they sang these songs also along the way. And we can look at Deuteronomy chapter 16, 16 and 17. We'll turn there, Deuteronomy 16, 16 and 17. And the Bible reads, Three times in a year shall all the male appear before the Lord thy God in the place of which he shall choose in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not before, appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given him. So, we know that three times a year, they had to travel to Jerusalem. It is believed that along these journeys, that these songs were also sang. Now, if one thing that we'd also try to do, and typically we would have done that before this part of it, 
And we try to find out who the author is. There is no author given for this song, but there's one thing that that jumps out that his position might be mentioned or revealed within this. If we look in the very last verse of Psalm 120, let's jump back to verse 6. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Some people claim that it is very probable that this psalm was written by a king. Because not your average person is concerned about peace. It, they don't, and war in the same aspect. They might want to live peaceably with all men, and the fact that they don't want to start conflict, but to be concerned about peace and war, that's typically held by the position of a king, because he's concerned with his country and all those that are under him. So it is probable and possible that the author of this psalm was held the position of a king. According to Keith L. Brooks, Christ is seen in Psalm 120 as David is herein a type of Christ, who is greatly distressed by lying lips and deceitful tongues, and found sufficient grace to bear in silence by waiting upon his heavenly father. Now, Keith L. Brooks claims that David was the author of this. But one thing I found in my Bible study is it doesn't matter if the song was titled by the author or not. Every commentator wants to say that this song was probably written by David. Well, guess what? If the Bible doesn't say it, we don't know it. It could in your Bible. And like I said, this commentator I read after said it was David. If the Bible doesn't say who it was, we don't really know, brother. If it's not clear, we don't know. Does that change the psalm at all? No. Does it change the importance at all? No. Does it change the use and what the Jews um, say? No. We just try to discover as much detail when we study but sometimes when it comes to the Word of God, we just have to say, if I don't know, I don't know, versus trying to make something up. So some people claim that it might have been David. Some people claim it might have been Hezekiah. We don't really know. It's not mentioned. But what we do know is from verses 6 and 7, it does appear because of his concern with peace and war that he may have been a king. I didn't really see any real divisions within this psalm, so we'll continue on to studying the book of Psalm uh, chapter 120 in a little bit more detail. When we look at this psalm, it's very similar to Psalm 119. Do you remember how the author of Psalm 119 viewed himself? Where did he think his home was? as a citizen of this world? He viewed himself as a citizen of somewhere else. He said that he is just a traveler here. He's just a sojourner here. So, we, and I don't want to go assumption because we can conclude that because he's crying out to God, his home was in heaven. But when he came to this earth, he viewed himself as a traveler, as somebody who's passing through. In Psalm 120, we get the same idea from this author. Because in verse 5, he says, Woe is me, that I sojourn in Meshach, and that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. He didn't really view himself as somebody that was stationary. But rather, we get the idea he viewed himself as a traveler. It may not come out and say that this world was not his home, but he was traveling. He 
He was moving on. He was not staying in one, one place. He did not have citizenship in just one place, but this was a place he was dressed traveling on. And we talked about that in last week in a little bit more detail, how we need to have that same mindset in our own lives. Now, so many times we get so fixated on the things of this world, and it just seems like this is where our citizenship is. Because our eyes get off of heaven. They get focused on this world and not focused up there. We forget that life is but a vapor, and that the trials of this lifetime are but for a short, short season. But yet they, and they suck us in, and they pull us in, and so our eyes get focused so much on them that we're just like Peter when Jesus told him to step out of the boat. Because our eyes get fixated on our surroundings, we get fixated on the storm, we forget that we're just a traveler, and life just consumes us to the point that it feels like we're sinking. Now this traveler does not mention about bills overtaking him and the creditors coming for him. He does not mention about how he has no food. But what is the problem of this, of the writer of Psalm 120? What has him in so much distress? Verse 2 tells us exactly what his distress is. Lying lips and a deceitful tongue. Lying lips and a deceitful tongue. You know, when it comes, we talked about verse 6 and 7 where he's concerned about war and peace. You know, one thing that can cause war and problems among people are lying lips and a deceitful tongue. Quicker than somebody throwing a fist punch or something. And really when it gets down to why do people get in fights in the first place? Is it because somebody just came out of the blue and punched you for some reason? Yeah, typically somebody was talking about their mama. No, but how many fights have we went back, started, or even wars, the reason they were started because somebody couldn't keep their tongue in a still position? Why do people get into um, bar fights? Probably because they get drunk and they said something they shouldn't have. It wasn't that they came up and just took a swung at somebody for no reason, but rather somebody said something. How many times have we got angry because somebody just came out and punched us versus somebody said something that they shouldn't have? Probably nine times out of ten, if not 9.9999999 times, any problems in life that cause distress when it comes to fighting, physical fighting, whether it be war, whether it's a bar fight, not that I'm saying that's just a bad example, but whether it be a fight, fist fight, hitting somebody with a baseball bat, hitting somebody's car with a baseball bat, nine times out of ten is because they said something. If we would face and sit down and be able to track them all is probably because somebody said something they shouldn't. And we find this individual in the same boat. The reason they're in stress, distress is because of lying lips and a deceitful tongue. Somebody's going around and lying about them, whether it's to their face or it's behind their back. What was David's problem with Absalom? Not that he didn't love him. But Absalom was meeting with the people in secret. He was talking. It was the tongue that was the problem. When it comes to workplace issues, if we've ever had them, probably what was the problem? Somebody was talking about them. They were lying. And what are they going to say in the workplace? If you go to your superior and say about this, well, that's just he say, she say. Basically, that's your word against theirs. But what does Proverbs 18.21 state about the tongue? Proverbs 18.21. No, that's James. Proverbs 
Is that Proverbs 18:21? No, it's Psalms. I quit it. Okay, let's try Proverbs 18:21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they so, that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Yes. So death and life are in the power of the tongue. The tongue can be used for good. It can be used for evil. But the tongue is extremely important because death and life are in it. It has the option. Why? Because words cut sharper than any sword or knife ever will. They are the one words will bring us to war and fighting quicker than anything in this world. Words will make us either feel good and lift us up, or words will push us down into a pit farther than anyone could ever place us, all because of of the human tongue. And as you've already said, said Mom, James 3, 8, the tongue is an unruly evil. You know, there are times in our life we probably said things without thinking it because it just slipped out. We thought it, and before you know it, it is out there. And we can take things back and try and fix things, but words are one thing that you can never take back or fix. Once it's out there, it's out there. And if you're talking about somebody behind their back, if you're lying about them, the tongue has life or death. And it is unruly evil. James in chapter 3 talked about that it is the rudder of the boat. It is what guides you. It is just a little member compared to the sails, compared to the body. But that little thing determines the entire course of the boat. Our tongue determines the course of our life and the course of our relationships with other people. If we're speaking evil of them, and that comes back around, that can cause us distress. If we're lifting people up, if we're encouraging them, that can do far more things than rubies or silver or gold because it just makes them feel so good. But if we're not careful, it is an unruly evil. And out of the abundance of our heart, our lips and our tongue speaks. And what does the Bible say about our heart? It is wicked and who can know it? But there is only one that knows it. But for those that speak evil, the Bible has a description for those harsh words, for those evil words. What does Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 8 state? Jeremiah 9, 8. So when it comes to evil words, when it comes to deceit, when it comes to lies, how does Jeremiah describe those words? As an arrow gone forth. If we go back to our Psalm 120 and look in verse 4, the Bible states, let me just back up to verse 3. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Now, let's talk about the tongue. Sharp arrows of the mighty with holes of <coughs> juniper. So we have that connection with the tongue and sharp arrows. When we're looking at Psalm 120, he mentions arrows of juniper. So these arrows are made from the juniper tree. When it gets down to the Palestinian region, they don't have coal like we do, from what I got. We here in Pennsylvania, we have anthracite, we have witness. And why do we burn coal versus something else? Because coal, bur um, it burns longer. Especially anthracite, that hard coal, it burns longer. If we go up to Centralia, the entire nation of America knows that there was a fire started there back in, I think it was the 40s or 50s, and it still burns today. Up to a few years, they had to evacuate the last residents out of the town because that coal vein is still on fire all these years later. It is a substance that burns and is long-lasting. Back in the Palestinian region, they will actually take the juniper tree and burn it like we would coal because 
the wood of the juniper tree burns for a very long time. The author of Psalm 120 states that these arrows are made with coals of juniper. So what does that tell us? That these aren't just arrows, but rather they're fiery arrows. Like someone was shooting in the time of battle from the castle wall against the enemy. They would light the end of the arrow on fire and launch it out at their enemy. This individual, his enemy, has launched fiery arrows that will last for a long time. They're not going to go out in mid-flight, but rather they are going to burn and burn and burn. But has God given us a weapon against these arrows? Has he given us a defense? What does Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16 say? Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Okay. Let's just keep that there for a second, Mom. So many times we use the armor of God and we'll say, quench all the fiery darts of the enemy or all the fiery darts of the devil. Does Saul, um, Ephesians chapter 6 there state that it's specifically for the darts of the devil? It says, of the wicked. Who's coming against this individual in Psalm 120? It's the wicked, obviously. They're deceitful. They're lying. If you study out the Greek word for wicked there at the end of Ephesians chapter 6, it does not point directly at the devil. It does not point directly at his minions. But rather, when you follow it and trace that word that was used and study out, it literally means just the wicked, those that are opposed you. So whether it be the enemy, the devil, or rather, or whether it be your mortal enemy, if Daniel wanted to go home and talk bad about me, and the shield would be used to prevent all those fiery darts that he'd be using. And I'm just using Daniel as an example. I know he would. But the fire, this shield of faith is used to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, whether they are mortal or immortal. God has given us an enemy uh, weapon to help us against these fiery darts. And we are supposed to try to be peacemakers. The Bible says um, that we are to do good to those that is, uh, despitefully use us. We are to pray for them. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. But you realize that we can try to be a peacemaker, but it does not always work. There are some people that just does not want to live peacefully with you. They just hate you and hate you and hate you, and that's all there is to it. They don't ever have anything nice to say about you. They're out there lying about you, deceiving you. They're out there spreading false rumors. They're coming against you. And you just can't, don't matter what you do, you can bend over backwards for them. And they're still going to talk evil of you. They could be homeless, and you could give them a place to live and food and everything else. But they are still going to talk evil of you. Sometimes it just does not work. Sometimes it does fail. In Psalm 120, verse 7, we find that I am for peace. The author is doing everything he can to live peaceably with his enemies. But, he says, but when I speak, they are for war. I lift him up. I encourage him. And all they do is slash at me with their words. They keep launching those fiery arrows at me. Or maybe they look good to my face, but then they go and lie behind my back. The author has tried to live peacefully with these people. But the problem is that these people are nothing but troublemakers. And they are rotten to the core. In verse 6, my soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. They don't want anything to do with peace. They are the farthest fraught thing from them. Hate and deceit rule their life, and they are out to destroy yours. 
But God has not left us to our own devices. He says, I have given you a weapon. I have given you the shield of faith. And if the shield of faith feels like it's ever going to fail, or if it feels like they are just beating down so heavy on that shield that we are stuck in the mud, we're down on the ground, we have our shield up, they're beating upon it, but we have nowhere to go, what does the Bible say? When the enemy comes in like the flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard. The Holy Ghost will come in and fight on our behalf. Because really when it comes down to it, as Christians, we need to fight. We can't just stand still and let the enemy hit us with arrows and slash at us and everything else. And when I say the enemy, I'm not talking about mortals. I'm talking about the devil because he uses people too. But even for those that are mortal, for those that we need to try and live peaceably with, whether they be family members, whether they're supposed to be friends and they're fake friends, whether they're people we work with, and maybe we've gone and we try to set things right and tell people, you know what, that's not what's really going on, this was going on. And they say, well, that's just your word against them. What advantage does the child of God have in those situations? When we can fight no more, who takes up our banner and fights for us? God fights for us. Because there are times where it may be completely out of con our own control. But really when it gets down to it, as Christians, we need to use our shield of faith when needed. But let God fight the battle. God can do more than you and I could ever do. We can bring it to people's attention. That might not work. We can try to live peaceably with the individual that are shooting those arrows that are lying behind our back, that are spreading rumors, but that might not work. Years ago, I had a guy at work that just absolutely hated me. Absolutely hated me. I don't know why. I have a good idea why. But he did everything in his power to get me fired. And he'd go back, and I don't know what he was telling the superiors or not, but it was so bad, I actually had a co-worker come to me and said, Justin, you need to do something because so-and-so is trying to get you fired. He goes, this is your livelihood. You need to do something. And I told him, I said, God will take care of it. Within a few months, the guy that was shooting those arrows at me that was trying to get me fired was running out the door with his tail between his legs because he was about to get fired if he didn't do something. Now, God will fight our battles, and he could do more than you and I could ever do. We need to believe it in his hands. Not that we don't use our shield when needed. Not that it, not saying we will ever get distressed or hurt by it. Because words do hurt. hurt. They are death or they are life. But for the child of God, no matter how much distress he might put us into, we need to take the word of God and realize that God is the one that fights our battles. It doesn't matter how much turmoil we may feel like we're in. God already has the battle already won. It may not feel like it. But because of that, how much more do we also need to watch our own words? Because as Christians, people are looking to us. And we can so easily hurt one another. And those same people that are launching maybe those arrows at us, we need to make sure that we are doing everything in our power that our words are life regardless. That we are trying to live peaceably with all men. Because in the end, God's the one that will sort it all out. I'm not saying it won't cause us grief, it won't cause us turmoil in our life. Because the Bible says that we are, will have tribulation. We will have troubles and we will have trials. But God also uses those troubles and trials to purify us, to purge us. For us to take those moments that say, God, so and so may be talking evil on me, but Lord, Cleanse my heart, and may I not retaliate with the same thing. May my heart be clean. May my conscience be pure, that I may be transformed in your very image. I may not understand what is going on. I may not understand why you're allowing this to happen. But, Lord, you change me into your very image, that you may be using me as a shining example. Because life is but a vapor. We don't know what tomorrow holds. 
And sadly, we may not see it in our lifetime, but maybe, just maybe, if the time should come when we're laying in that casket, maybe that individual, that will be their turning point when they get right with God and their entire life change all around. All because we allowed God to work in our lives. Yes, it was uncomfortable. It was stressful. And sometimes it may have taken us, it felt like into the pits of despair. But if God be for us, who can be against us? May we guard our tongue against all evil. Because there is coming a day when the Bible says every word will be judged, whether spoken or unspoken. God, help us to bridle our tongue, that we may be, that our words may only be life and not death. Does anybody have anything they want to add at this point in time? If not, let us bow our heads in prayer and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God, God who reigns on high, that, that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, once again, I know we've already prayed this once, but we pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property above and below. Let no attack of the enemy penetrate, Lord, whether physical, whether verbal, Lord, whether spiritual, Lord. Keep all hindrances away this morning that our eyes may be fixated on you, that our minds and our hearts would be pure and ready to receive the message which you have for us, that we may be transformed to your very image even farther, and that we may know you even more in the power of your resurrection, Lord. Lord, take away the desires of our hearts and give us the desires of your heart, Lord. Change us to be the individuals you want us to be. Anoint the song leader and the musicians as they praise you upon the string instruments, upon the vocal cords. Anoint the speakers this morning, Lord. Anoint their minds and lips to bring forth your words. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus.